seated. If you don't have your Bible, I would ask you to take your neighbors, just steal it from them, and uh, uh, take it and turn with me to Hosea. If you don't have an outline, please lift your hand, and these guys will give you one. Everyone needs one. Look around, guys. Make sure you get everyone. Um, as we come to Hosea, no fighting over Bibles, stop that. Um, we do come to a glorious, glorious chapter as we continue in our study of this little powerhouse book of one of the minor prophets. We've said that the book of Hosea is one of the minor prophets. It doesn't mean that his message means any less. It's simply shorter. And so this morning we come again to this glorious passage of Scripture. And the title, notice the title at the top of your outline or on the screen that's in front of you, The Steadfast Love of God versus the fickle love of man. And there's, there's really the full title, the steadfast love of God versus the fickle love of humanity, of even his people, um, of Israel specifically in this storyline. And so we've come, and for those of you who are new to us, um, this review may help you just a little bit, and you'll need to go back and study it and read it a little bit more. In fact, there's outlines in the back of the worship center of the last six or the last seven messages. This is message eight. Um, if you're clicking online and watching us online, you can simply click down below the video on our website and you can download the message, the notes yourself. So let's look at the review. First of all, Hosea was a prophet. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't just a uh, missionary or just a, simply a preacher. He was a prophet of God in the Old Testament and in the Northern Kingdom. The kingdoms had been divided, or the kingdom of, of, of God's people had been divided. And so it became Israel to the north, or Ephraim, um, and, and this was around 750 BC. So about 750 years before Christ would be born, this prophet was preaching to the nation of Israel. Look at number two. Hosea's wife and his children were a living example. Fill that in. They were, their lives and their names were a living example of Israel's unfaithfulness to God. Um, for those that are new this morning, God told this prophet to go and to marry a promiscuous woman. You say, oh my goodness, I got to read that. That's chapters 1, 2, and 3. Go read chapter 1, 2, and 3, and you will see that this was a life example to the nation of Israel. They knew this guy, Hosea. They knew his wife, Gomer, and they knew that she was unfaithful to Hosea, but yet Hosea was faithful to her. And this was the, the living example of God's love to their nation who was not faithful to God. And so we see this amazing, and we've called it even scandalous love. That's the title of our series, Hosea, God's Scandalous Love. Um, and so we see that from this living example. Number three, Hosea's primary message was Israel is unfaithful to God and his judgment is coming. Now, when we say primary, we're not saying this is the only message or the most important message even, but it certainly takes up most of the book. And we've noticed that. Notice this, his primary message is, and let's read what his primary message is again there in the middle of number three. What is it? It is Israel is unfaithful to God. Okay, that's only one-tenth of you. Let's all read that statement together in the middle of number three. What does it say? Israel is unfaithful to God, and his judgment is coming. If you understand that, as you're reading the book of, of, of Hosea, you'll start to see how their unfaithfulness is being laid out open and open more and more and more, where it's becoming clearer and clearer that they're going out after other gods. They're loving themselves. They're not, they're not being just with the people around them. They're simply unfaithful, not only to God, but the life that he has called them to live. So Israel is unfaithful to God. And God is saying, 
You have been unfaithful to me, and under this Mosaic covenant, that because of their unfaithfulness, jo- judgment is going to come to them. And we studied last week, we looked at the history of Israel and w- the history of Judah, and we see that other nations, because of their unfaithfulness to God, are going to come and take them into captivity. And they're going to spend decades, in some cases hundreds of years, um, in great turmoil, in great conflict, in their, in their land, and then they're going to be taken out of their land in uh, captivity. But notice this as well, number four. Hosea's secondary message is, and it's simply because it's a shorter part of it, is that God is faithful and will ultimately redeem his people. God is faithful and will ultimately redeem these unfaithful nations. Um, look at number five. God, Hosea's message is, is to Israel, ex, excuse me, Hosea's message to Israel is extremely valuable to today's church. This message is extremely valuable to us. It's not, we, we do not receive the message of Hosea as the nation of Israel did. This message from Hosea was to Israel, but we can look and we can see what is happening with them and we can learn a great deal about a few things. And I want you to see what some of the things are that we can learn about um, as, we, as we study this, this interaction with God in the nation of Israel. Letter A, we see God's long-suffering nature. So his long-suffering nature, the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. He is immutable. He doesn't mutate. And so we see that this is part of who God is. God is a long-suffering God. He is slow to anger, and he's abounding in loving kindness. Notice the next thing that we see. We see our spiritual adultery in Israel's spiritual adultery. Many of you have commented that you said, you know, this is all about Israel's unfaithfulness to God, but it's a very good description of our unfaithfulness to God. It's, it's, it's a very good picture of how we still have other idols too. They may not be Moloch, but they may be, I don't know, the NFL, or they may be LeBron, or well, not so much anymore. Or they may be, you know, some of the others. I mean, you know, whatever, we start to see that, that we, too, struggle with many of the same things that they did. You know, there's, not, there's nothing new under the sun. In fact, we see in Hosea, we see that he even lists a bunch of the Ten Commandments. He's talking about lying and stealing and cheating and adultery, sexual immorality. Well, you're, you could be describing Israel, but you could also be describing um, our present day and time. And in fact, um, even those who claim to know God. Notice the next part. Let us see here. We've really just sung about this. We see the wooing power. Do you like that name, that word woo? Some of you immediately look at the screen and say, how do I spell that? W-O-O, woo. Um, the wooing power of the bridegroom's love. Now, I want you to understand that God's love is so gracious and so powerful and so rich and so romantic that he is drawing his people to himself. He is calling his people. He is setting the table. He is setting the table for a date that's never been, uh, uh, unlike any date that's ever been seen. He He is coming and adorning his bride. He is coming and getting ready for a marriage feast that is going to be glorious. This is a, this is a romantic, passionate God who loves his people truly loves his people. And so we see this in the book of Hosea. If you will come and study the whole message with us, you will begin to see this this kind and gentle, loving God who ultimately, through his power, calls us to himself, especially as we get toward the end. Notice letter D. We see why, in Hosea, we see why joyful submission to God, we see why joyful submission to God makes complete sense. I love this one. It it, it just simply, when, when you start to look at the options 
of loving everything else in the world that doesn't satisfy, loving everything else in the world that ultimately comes up empty versus loving the one who knows all things, owns all things, can do all things, it simply doesn't make sense to go after the stuff that's passing away. Now, our flesh cries out for it, we want it, we like the feeling, or we like the rush, or we like the, the sentiments that are very real around us, but ultimately, those things do not last. And God is saying, come and learn of me, come and know me, come and let me love you. And if you will do that, you will have satisfaction that nothing in this world can ever rival And so it just makes complete sense for us to come and joyfully submit to a loving God. Look at number six. Last week in Hosea chapter five, we saw the foreshadowing of coming judgment and exile. If you you were to look back and see toward the the last half of chapter five, we saw that God is saying, I'm going to come like a lion and I'm going to tear you to pieces. I'm going to wipe out your land. I'm going to I'm going to come and I'm going to give, put a hurting on you that you have never seen before. And all of it is designed ultimately to turn you back to me. We see that this is part of what God does. It's in his mercy and in his grace that he comes and he chastises his people. And even the exile will bring them to their knees until they no longer worship other gods until they know the the, the worship of Moloch is going to be beaten out of them by foreign entities, which is so sad that God has to raise up people who do not know him to make his people stop doing what they're doing in this way. But he can can do anything along those lines, and we see that's what he's doing with Israel in in this circumstance. He's going to come and correct them. But so now we come to chapter 6. And in chapter 6, we see this this tremendous breath of fresh air. Um, Verses 1 through 3 is this genuine call to repentance. And you can fill that in on the right-hand side. This is a genuine call for God's people to repent. And it's perhaps even a foreshadow of of a repentance that they do not yet, um, that they have not yet come to. Um, but they will. It is a foreshadowing of, foreshadowing of the fact that they are going to repent um, eventually. And notice here with me that in verses 1, 2, and 3, and this is in the box on your page, this begins our scripture study uh, of the text this morning. Look at chapter 6 and verse 1. Come. See that word again? He's saying, come. Let us what? <clears throat> Return to the Lord. Same as we just saw in the last chapter. For he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up that we may live before him. Underline that. That we may live before him. You see, over and over we see look to God and live. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly, an abundant life. He says that we may live before him. Look at verse 3. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn, and he will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains watering the earth. This is a tremendous call to genuine repentance. Now, remember with me that we saw last week that in verse, chapter 5 and verse 6, we see this quick repentance that they were trying to do, and that is not what it, we're talking about here. This is not talking about the quick fix repentance. The quick fix of repentance is when you're in trouble, you're feeling the pain of your circumstance and your, and your hardship, and all of a sudden you're crying out for relief right now, but you're not really interested in coming to God. You just want relief from your circumstances. Now, what we've said is, is that God has all the time in the world to wait until you're really ready to come. 
And when you're really ready to come, he knows the difference between your quick fix repentance and your coming to God in submission, in genuine repentance. You know, it's as if the Lord is looking at us and saying, you know, Andrew, we can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. <laughs> right? It's, my will is going to happen and my work in your life is going to happen. And, and I'm calling you to live right here by me and stop running off and me having to jerk the chain. Okay. So here we come and we see this is not quick fence re repentance. Instead, in this passage, we see, look what it says in verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. This is a, a God-centered repentance. It's saying, come, let us return to God. It's not come, let us return to our own senses alone. It's not come, let us return to our prosperity that we used to have when we were with God. No, God is saying he's calling us to come back to him. And so we see this. It's a God-centered repentance. Not only that, it is a God-given repentance. God gives this. He, he grants this to us. After, look what it says in verse, two, or in verse 1. For he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down that he may bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. After three days, on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. And so we, we see this picture is that, is that God is, is calling us back to himself, and he is even coming and moving and working within us. Now, this is a, a God-given repentance that, is, that is also mirrors the, the reference to the Messiah. This is one of those prophetic things that is mentioned in Luke chapter 24 and verse 26. So all the way over in the New Testament, 750 years later, we see that there's the reference that Jesus was laid in the tomb. He rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. This is one of those scriptures that is talking about, that is referenced from Luke um, referring to this Messiah King who comes and brings his people back to God, that he is coming and giving up his life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 4, similarly, that we see this idea of the third day he would rise from the dead. And so, this is this is not necessarily the nation of Israel being obviously the Messiah because they are not the Messiah. Messiah is Messiah. And, but the, we do see that this picture of the way that God rescues us is ultimately in Messiah. It's ultimately in Jesus Christ, the one who would come, Son of God, and die on the cross for our sins. And so God gives the sacrifice, and God gives even the grace to turn to him. Notice this in verse 3. Look what it says. Let us know. Let us underline that. Press on to know the Lord. You see, the picture is in a fallen world, it is not easy to walk with a holy God. We have this little bit of time and it's almost like, you remember back in the, I don't even know if they still do this. I hardly listen to the radio anymore. Have you ever heard of the emergency broadcasting system? You ever heard of that before? You know, you're sitting there listening to your favorite song, and all of a sudden it goes, and you start punching around on the radio, and you're like, this is annoying. And it's saying, you know, this is the test of the emergency broadcast system. And in the event of an actual emergency, you would have a message da, 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 to tell you where to turn and get information about what's happening. And so it's almost like this life is simply a test of the eternal system. And so God is giving us this opportunity in this little bit of time, this little short 70 or 80 or 90 years. We have some ladies here, some guys here that are in their 80s and in their 90s, and they'll say, make no mistake about it, it's short. Amen. And the older you get, the faster, you, the faster it goes, right? I'm starting to experience that. When you're in middle school, you're thinking, how long, oh Lord? <laughs> you know, you are. You say, yeah, that was a middle schooler that wrote that um, psalm. You know, I, middle school, nothing seems to come fast enough. Not the end of the class, not your driver's license, not, you know, your dad's lecture, not anything. It is, how long, oh Lord? But when you get to be 85, you start to go, don't blink. 
you will miss it. And so this life is very short. And this is simple. We have this glorious opportunity to give honor to God. And listen to this. The results of this life are eternal. And so if you, if you turn away and deny God and simply are unfaithful to God in all of eternity, you are judged in that. But if you come to his salvation plan through Christ and you simply say, Lord, nothing that I bring only to the cross I cling, this is my only hope, he says, welcome home. And for eternity, we get to experience a right relationship with him, not based upon our righteousness, but based upon his righteousness. And so this is this, is this picture of this, this, this walk with God is not easy. It's not, it's not an easy go, but look at verse 3. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. And it's also interesting that God is very interested in us knowing him. He wants us to know him, to know him personally, to have an intimate knowledge of him, to come to know how he is and what he thinks and what he's like and what he wants and what he loves. And so some people wonder why nothing ever seems to go right in their walk with God, but it's that they've never come to seek to know him. How do we come to seek to know him? He's given us a book that describes himself. And this is part of the reason even the study of Hosea is important, because we're learning about things in Hosea that are emphasized that we desperately need to see. And though it's a, it's kind of a, it's a deep study and it's kind of difficult and it points back at us quite a bit, It's ultimately showing us God's great holiness and our great unholiness. And that's good for us because then we come to see who he really is and who we are not and our need for him. And in the course of that, we come to really know him, which is what he is all about. I... I would love to stay on that point and even finish with that point, Um, but we have so much in this I want you to see. It's, notice this as well, it is a persistent repentance that is here, and not only a persistent repentance, but it is a God-blessed repentance. This is a repentance that God comes and rains down upon Israel blessing as he brings them back into the land and he reestablishes them. And we see that God comes and he blesses in this way. Look what it says in verse 3. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn. Everything else may be kind of messed up, but his way is sure. Now look at the last part. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains watering the earth. Now, this is, you know, here in Florida, we get rain every month of the year. And uh, in fact, we we really have quite a bit of rain. We, We have some of the most rain of anywhere in the continental United States. But where this was written, and in the circumstance where Israel lived, they only have rain for a few months out of the year. And it's those, 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 early rains in the spring that come and they break up the hard ground and they come and they prepare the ground for after the cold season is over for the ground to be ready to be planted on. And those spring rains come and bring the harvest. Those spring rains come and bring the crop that is going to allow there to be great blessings and sustenance. And that's what we see here is that when God's people are repenting and coming back to him in his salvation, that we get to experience the tremendous glory of his blessings. Now, there's a a phrase in this that I don't want us to miss, so we're going to hop back up to verse 1. Look at verse 1 again. It says, come let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down that he will bind us up. As I was studying and preparing for this, I felt like the Lord was impressing upon me to show you some verses that I think are often overlooked, 
often ignored, often misunderstood in this present day of health, wealth, gospel, in this present day of consumer-driven Christianity. I want you to see a tremendous concept that is here that may save your faith someday. There are many people who, who seem to come and walk with the Lord until something shakes them greatly, and because they are not prepared for suffering in a fallen world in this present life, they blame it on God, and they walk away from Him, saying that this God not only did this, but this shows to me that He is not good. But I want you to see here a different perspective that may save your faith. In his great mercy and love, key phrase at the beginning, in his great mercy and love, God sometimes afflicts to save us and grow us. In his mercy and love, God sometimes afflicts to save us and grow us. Can you please read Psalm 119, verse 67 with me? Everybody clear your throat. Go ahead and clear your throat. <clears throat> you ready? Let's read Psalm 119, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Wow. Look at Psalm 119, 71. Let's read that one. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. We begin to, to see God's way. We begin to see his law. We begin to see the way he works, his rules, as we begin to see it very often through our affliction. Let's read verse 75. I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Wow, you say, I've never seen those verses before. Yeah, they're not very popular with the idea that God is a grandfatherly figure that just wants to give you all of the things that you ask for, that he's the genie that you rub the, the little container and out he pops to meet all of your desires. No, this God wants you to know him. This God wants to cut through the current culture. He wants to cut through the current circumstances of your, of your attention and come that you would come to, to know him in his goodness by faith. Look at Psalm 51 verse 8. We looked at this last week. In Psalm 51 verse 8 it says, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have, what? Broken, Broken rejoice. Wow. So that God comes and he is, he is actually working in our lives through the difficulty. He is using these things to cause us to look to him and listen to him and learn of him that we may walk in his way. Another example of this great concept is in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 12 and verse 7 through 10. The apostle Paul, a man of, of great commitment to God, um, certainly not perfect, but a man of great passion for obedience to God and loving God and sacrifice and all of those things, he had a thorn in the flesh. He had something wrong with him. If somebody tells you what his thorn in the flesh was, just go, mm-hmm, and then just look at him like you don't know what you're talking about because they don't know what they're talking about. We don't know what his thorn in the flesh was. Some people say, you know, it was his eyes, or somebody says it was sciatic nerve, or somebody says that, you know, somebody has even suggested it was his wife. No, I mean, that's, I'm like, <laughs> where you get that from, man? You, I, I don't know, but, but notice that there was something wrong, we would assume, with his body. It was some lasting pain that went decade after decade, perhaps. Look what it, here we see that Paul's thorn in the flesh was given to him for Paul's good and God's glory. You see, it would not have been good for Paul to exalt himself and think much of his message. In fact, in that passage, it says that the revelations were so extreme and they were so powerful and the messages were so powerful that he could have exalted himself. He could have thought much of himself. But God said, nah, I'm going to keep you in pain so much so that you have to keep looking to me. 
You see, God uses affliction to keep us close to Him. Notice the next part that is here. You've faithfully turned your sheet over. Very good. Chapter 6 and verse 4. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? So it's both northern kingdom and southern kingdom. Ephraim is the, is the main tribe, the largest tribe of Israel, so it's, they're used often synonymously there. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning, morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. I want you to see here, and this is part of where we get our sermon titled, in verse 4, we see the reality of Israel's fickleness. It's not a word we use every day, fickle, but it's a very good word. It's a very accurate word. The idea of fickle is, is going hot and cold on affection. The idea of fickle is one moment all in, another moment indifferent or perhaps even opposed. This is on again, off again affection. And we see that the Lord is not interested in on again, off again affection because it's so unlike him. He's so different than that. Notice here that this affection is based in selfishness. This affection is based upon what do I get out of the thing? I really like you when you're being my sugar daddy. I really like you when you're giving me what I want and you're acting the way I want you to act. But I really don't like you when it's not like that. You see, there's some people that come to worship, they come to church thinking, well, I'm here to receive, I'm here to give. This is part of consumer-driven Christianity where people are being just, uh, you know, the, the churches are appealing to people's desires, what they want to hear, what they want to sing, what they want to feel, what they want to do, the, the idea of having intrigue or entertainment. And it's the idea of, well, I come to worship to feel better. I want to tell you that that's a slippery slope that leads into a narcissistic view of not only yourself, but the world around you, where you miss out on what we were designed for, which is to worship God. God has called us to worship Him. God has called us to come and to worship Him. If the main reason that we come is to say, you know, He created us. He has redeemed us. We are to come and to worship him. If I come and begin to recognize the great glory of who he is and rejoice in his goodness and rejoice in who he is, what is amazing about that is, is that true worship results in tremendous blessings. But selfish worship results in emptiness. Selfish worship eventually results in not being satiated, not ever being truly fulfilled. So here we see that Israel was always ready to go worship when God was going to bless them as so to speak, which is why they gather. They say, oh, we've got problems. Get some bulls, get some goats, get some, get some sheep. Let's run back over there and let's offer up to the Lord. And God is saying, this is a quick fix repentance. You're not really interested in me. I'm not going to show up. I'm going to wait. I've got all the time in the world until you really mean it. Now, I wanted to say to you, the answer to that is not don't come to God. It's come to God and mean it. It's come to God and be laid bare before him and to recognize that it's not all about you. It's about him. It's about his body. When church members begin to realize that the church isn't here to just serve you, and they begin to realize that, man, that this church, I get to serve in the body of Christ. I get to be a part of the body of Christ. And we begin to find our place in the body of Christ. There we find the joy of being connected to the body and being connected to the body who has a head, which is Jesus Christ. And so we see this affection that is based on selfishness. And this is what causes God. And, and do you see where we're getting that from? I mean, look what it says there. Your love is like the morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. It, it, it's, the picture is, is that it's here for a little bit and then it's gone. 
Now, I admit, um, here in Florida, we don't see the morning fog very often. Maybe once every two or three years, you'll have early fog. And I remember whenever we would go to the mountains of North Carolina when I was a kid, I remember always thinking it was so cool when you got to drive through a cloud. Um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a cool thing. Or in the morning, you would see, if you were up on a mountain, you would see the, the clouds laying low um, somewhere there in the valley or something along those lines. But, you know, after a little while, that cloud just disappears. It's just gone. And that's what God is saying is what Israel's affection is like. It's here now, and it's gone a few minutes later. It's here for a little bit, but then it's gone. You see, this type of affection is driven by emotion, not commitment. This type of affection is not driven by the kind of love that God has. It is driven simply by emotions. Well, let's move on. Look at verse 5 with me. Even they're on the screen or on the page in front of you. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And my judgment goes forth as the light. Now, the word hewn is a very interesting word. Now, I want you to see verse 5 is about God's rebuke. This is the rebuke of God's word. God brings a word of rebuke to his people, and it is a violent word. In fact, here we see in verse 5, it says, therefore I have hewn them. Can you circle the word hewn? What in the world does, a, is it, does it mean to hew something? Well, a hew is is an axe with a very wide blade. It's this wide-bladed axe, and the purpose of a hew is that you can take a tree log, and you can cut the bark off one side of it, and then you can go cut the bark off another side of it, and then cut the bark off another side of it, and you can, you can create, cut all that bark off, you can create a beam, not just a pole, but a squared beam. So it's a, it's a, it's a wide-bladed axe that is very, very destructive. And so what God is saying is, I have hewn them. I have come, and through my prophets, I have shown the nation of Israel that they are wrong. I have shown them that they are out of bounds. I am cutting off the parts that must be cut off for them to see what they need to see. In fact, it goes on to say, I have slain them by the words of my mouth. So the word hewn means to actually chop. In fact, in 1 Samuel, Samuel hewed Ahag to pieces, Agag to pieces, hewed this guy. To, you can go read it yourself. I mean, it's a rather violent story. But the picture is, is that, that this is both physical and spiritual in God's call. Now, God's word is that which cuts deep. I want you to see this passage from Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11 through 13. Do you see it on the screen in front of you? Notice this idea. Let us strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Here it is, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow in discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You see, God, he just, in his laser beam ability, in his ax blade ability, he comes and cuts down into what is real in us. He can see through all of our foolish schemes. He can see through our false affections. He can see through our false repentance. And so he says, he says, come and by my words... I will come and lay bare what needs to be laid bare. In verse 13, it says, Let no creature, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now here, how, how does God do this? God does this through truth and through his word. And that's part of what we see here in verse 13. Five, he's saying, therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth, circle it, as the light. You see, the light reveals what's in darkness. And so when we let the light of God's 
presence and the light of God's truth come and shine in our mind and in our heart. It reveals what's there. And so the safest thing to do when we begin to experience God's acts of cutting on our heart through his word, maybe from preaching, maybe from your own personal Bible study, or from maybe doing a Bible study with friends, reading scripture together, your own quiet time. When you begin to experience God cutting into your heart, don't close it up and run away. Say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. What do you mean, Lord? Speak to me, Lord. Show me. Now, there's nothing except the grace of God that can lead you in that, but it's his light that does this. Now, I want you to see here with me, there's this concept called the glory of God and salvation through judgment. And there's a couple of aspects to this concept, but it, it, Dr. James Hamilton has, has written a whole book on this. I think it's a, I think it's a helpful book. It's kind of a, a heavy book. It's not in our bookstore yet, but it will be. But it's that, that God's glory is seen in salvation through judgment, and not only salvation from judgment, but salvation through judgment. We begin to cherish the gospel more when we see the reality in the stark contrast of salvation versus judgment and condemnation. And so we begin to see that God in his mercy is bringing about a judgment that Israel can see around them, and even from in their midst, that would come and cut them to the core, and that even for us, in a different setting but similar, that we can see that God brings us to a repentance. Now, now in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, it's at the bottom of the page, and I do want you to see it right now, but look down there at the bottom of the page. Look what it says. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, what does it say? Christ died for us. So God shows his love for us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, very often we stop right there, don't we? We like Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his own love toward us, and that we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. We love to share that. We love to talk about that. And we really miss out if we stop there. And so I put up on the screen, don't stop. No stopping any time there. Don't stop at verse, at verse 8. Just, just mark that out. Notice what's in verse 9 and 10 and 11. Here we see the grand salvation. Look what it says in verse 9. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from what? The wrath of God. The wrath of God is fierce. Look at verse 10. For if while we were sinners, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. That's how serious he is. His wrath is so great that the second person of the Trinity would come and give his life unto death in a humiliating death. Look what it says, verse 10, for if we were enemies, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we're reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Verse 11, more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received, underline that word, reconciliation. Being made right with God, being brought back to God. And all of this is accomplished through the glorious work. In fact, on your outline, you can fill in up there under Romans 5, 8 through 11. Christ, the living word, receives God's judgment unto death so that we may live. Christ, the living word, receives God's judgment unto death so we may live. Look at verse 6. For I desire steadfast love. This is, in fact, put a big circle around all of verse 6 because this is, this is also a key part of even our title and the main part of the entire chapter that we're looking at right here. Look what it says. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offering. So the first line is one part of the poetry. Second line is expounding on that poetry. So look at the first line in verse six. It says, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. That's, that he, he doesn't want a fickle love. 
He's not interested in what you're going to go do for him. He's interested in you coming and being with him. Not interested in you buying your way out of your sin. He's saying, I will come and make the sacrifice for your sin. I'm, I desire steadfast love, not sacrifice. And then here it is, for the knowledge of, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Here's the great desire, fill it in, of God's heart. This is God's great desire. Our God is a passionate God who loves us. He is passionately in love with us. And we see that his desire is the restoration of true relationship with him. This is his grand design, that we would be in true relationship with him, not a fake relationship, not cultural Christianity, not cultural Sheridan Hills, you know, I'm okay, you're okay, don't really ask me anything, I won't really ask you anything, we'll just come have a nice time together for a little bit, a couple times a week, and then we go back to our houses. No, that, that's not what it's about. The, pro- the point is, is that Tommy is supposed to help Andrew walk with Jesus, and Andrew's supposed to help Tommy walk with Jesus. We're, we're to be in this thing together, we're to be helping one another make it through this life so that when we get to the end, whenever that is, we're ready for him ready to meet him, ready in faith in, the G- in Jesus Christ, our Savior, and ready in faithfulness that has come to us through the power of his Holy Spirit and through the encouragement of the saints around us. This is God's grand design. You see, this is the everlasting covenant of his salvation. Is that, that's what he brings in Ezekiel 37, 27. And then we finally see it played out in Revelation 21. Where is Revelation 21 in your Bible? Where is that? all the way at the end. And if you go all the way to the end, you see when everything's said and done, it's that God is going to be with his people. And there'll be no more crying. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more disease. There'll be no more death. And there'll be no more sin. And finally, all the former things are going to be done. And it says, and God himself will be among his people. And so I, I want us to see here that this is God's heart desire. Now, this is also what we see is not the case with Israel. And this is what is so important for us to see that it can also reflect upon, even though Israel has done this, that we too can find ourselves in this, in this case. Look at chapter 7 and verse 10, or, or chapter 6, verse 7 through 10. Look what it says in verse 7. But like Adam they transgressed the covenant. Put above the word covenant, mosaic, the mosaic covenant. But like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. They, there they dealt faithlessly with me. So they were not faithful, they were faithless. Gilead is a city of evildoers. So Gilead used to be a city of righteousness, but now it's a city of evildoers tracked with blood. So there's blood all over the streets because of their violent nature of evildoers. Look at verse 9. As robbers lie in wait for a man, so the priests band together. They murder on the way to Shechem, and they commit villainy. Wow. Look at verse 10. In the house of Israel I have seen a horrible thing, Ephraim's whoredom is there. Remember they, that idea of whoredom, they keep going out after other gods, and Israel is defiled. So I want you to see, and right out there to the side, verses 7 through 10, this is the depth of Israel's fall into sin. They've fallen into sin in this way. This likely points to their failure to keep the Mosaic Covenant. That's what I believe that it's speaking of here And this isn't just the Ten Commandments, but it's the ceremonial and the moral law. It's this picture that they've forgotten it all. They've forgotten what it says about God's holiness and their sinfulness. They've rejected it all. They've dealt faithlessly with God. They don't even know who he is anymore, as we've seen in the other chapters. Notice the darkness and depravity of their sin. You know, when you get away from God, you're capable of anything. When we begin to run in our own selfishness and our own sinfulness, you, there are many people who say, you know, I would never do that. Mm. 
Well, first of all, you don't have to do the most grotesque sin that you've ever seen around you or you've ever heard of to not be right with God or to hurt others. Your little piddly sin can still separate you from God just as a grotesque sin can. In fact, it was the sins of Achan, little tiny sins, one guy with some loot in his tent that stopped the whole nation of Israel. We begin to see the character of God and what he's after. You see, he's interested in our hearts being open and broken before him, being clean before him. We begin to see his nature. We begin to see his work. We notice the darkness and the depravity of their sin. Even the priests are in on the murder. And that word villainy in the Hebrew, zema, it is the wicked schemes. It's a very dark word. The wicked schemes of their way. You see, Israel had truly run far from God. And then we see this as it ends in verse 11. For you also, Judah, a harvest is appointed. Now, what's kind of interesting is Hosea is speaking to the nation of Israel to the north and to the people of Israel to the north. And there's this kingdom to the south called Judah. And while Hosea is blasting away at Israel for all of their transgressions, it's almost like Judah is standing off over there to the side with this very smug look going, "Mm mm-hmm. Did you tell them, you tell them, Hosea, you tell them because they're horrible. You just tell them. And, and then it's as if Hosea turns and looks at Judah. And look what he says in this, in verse 11. For you also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed. He's saying you're going to reap what you've sown as well because Judah was unfaithful as well. When I restore the fortunes of my people... And so this, this picture is, is that there may be his true people who are restored, but you who are not are going to experience my judgment and my wrath. We need to recognize, Sheridan Hills, that all of our little sins, and all of our little ways are before God. And he calls us to be a people who embrace genuine repentance before him. And by his mercy and by his grace, which he has poured out on Christ, we simply come to the end of ourselves and we hold on to Christ. This is how you make it with God. When you come to recognize it's not in me, but it's all in him. It's not in what I'm going to do, but it's in what he's already done. Nothing in my hand I bring, only to the cross I cling. We sing it a thousand different ways in this church. Not in me, but all in you. Not in the prayers, not in holy dress, not in the sacrifices, not in the money given, not in these things will I gain your favor. It's only in you. In fact, in just a moment, we're going to sing... Hallelujah, hallelujah, all I have is Christ. If that is the understanding and if that is the brokenness and the belief of your heart, my friend, you understand what Hosea is getting at. You understand what God is getting at because this is what he desires. I want you to see this again with me at the bottom of the page. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Look what it says in verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, you see, there was nothing in our hand to bring. We didn't have anything. We were already violated him. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, that means made right with God because of his sacrifice, his death, much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Verse 11, more than that, We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. 
God desires for you to be made right with him. And my friend, that can only happen, that can only happen through you simply coming to Christ and saying, Lord, I recognize that you're the Savior and I'm the sinner. Lord, help me to come to you. Help me, O oh God, to see and to trust in you. Lord, I believe in what you have done. This is how we come. And he delivers us out of the miry clay that we found our, find ourselves in in this earthly life, that we surrender to Christ. Look at the bottom statement that is here. God's perfect redemption, His perfect redemption comes through His perfect judgment poured out on Christ. You see, judgment is not a bad word. For the saved, judgment is a glorious word because it was the judgment of God that was not given to you but given to Christ that you were spared from the wrath of God because of his great love. So perfect redemption comes through his perfect judgment poured out in Christ. Amen? Would you stand together with me for prayer?